Good morning. Hallelujah. I hope everybody is doing good today and having a wonderful day in the Lord. And even though you might be going through trials, heartaches, pains, you're still having a wonderful day in the Lord. Because hopefully and prayerfully you know your times are in His hands. Everything in your life is in His hands. You are His workmanship. Hallelujah. This devotional today, you know, we are God's masterpiece. It's the name of this devotional by T. Austin Sparks. You know, this is awesome. As I was putting this together, I just was thanking the Lord because His Word is so awesome. And He tells us in His Word, really, everything we need to know. And He also tells us things in our heart. He gives us promptings. Shows us what to do, which way to go. He says, you'll hear me behind you, a voice behind you. It'll be me my voice and you'll hear me saying go this way go that way you know we we have nothing to fear we have nothing to be in anxiety over if we could just get this solid in our spirit you know we would it would just save us so much stuff and it's a wonderful thing just to believe god's word believe what he says just believe it simply believe it in Ephesians 2 10 he says for we are his workmanship we are his people we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works we were created in Christ Jesus unto good, good works. We were created for a purpose. And he has good works, good things for us to be doing. Ordained things for us to be doing in our life. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, that's simple, isn't it? Isn't that just simple to read that and believe it? He made us for a reason. We have a reason for being. We have a purpose for being. Ultimately, it's to give glory to his name. That he can work through us. Be our hands. Be our feet. Be our heart. We can be. Him. Representing him. In this walk on the earth. We are his representatives. He lives within us. Okay. Let's just get that really down deep. Okay. Deep. We are not Jesus Christ, let me make that very clear, but we are his representatives. We are his representatives on this earth, okay? His ambassadors on this earth. And he has ordained some works for us to walk in. And as long as we are walking in and by his spirit, we're going to fulfill those works that he ordained us to do. Let's look a little further into Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. And that word workmanship means product. We are his product. We are his fabric to work on. We are the thing that is made. That he made. Now in a fabric... You know, they print the pattern on the fabric. And he puts his print 
on us. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and good works there is acts, labors, deeds, things he's got set out before the beginning of time for us to do, which God hath before ordained, or he's fit up in advance, he's fit us to that purpose that he made us for, prepared aforetime, ordained, that we should walk in them, that we should walk in these works, or be occupied with these works, live in these works, okay? How simple is that? And as long as we walk by the Spirit, we will. We will fulfill those works. Because the Lord tells us if we walk by His, his Spirit, we are not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what He said. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. If we have come to Him, we have repented of our sins. He's given us a new heart. We are a new creature. New in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things He has planned for us long ago. This devotional now by T. Austin Sparks. You look back on your life. You may be disappointed in many ways with your part in this business of what we're just talking about. You may be able to see many falterings and blunderings and mistakes that you, on your side, made. The mistakes are not on God's side, for He makes no mistakes. You may have sometimes felt that you were not the person for that job. God had made a mistake, you say. How many times have we all been there? I know John and I have been there in this ministry he's put us in on the internet and even abroad. We have felt very many times that we were not the person for this job. <laughs> but God said, I've ordained you before the beginning of time. The good works that I have ordained for you to do. And you'll do them, he says, as long as you walk by my spirit. <clears throat> I'm going to read that again. You may have sometimes felt that you were not the person for that job. God had made a mistake, you said. Well, hey, listen, God doesn't make any mistakes. He is a perfect God, so therefore He makes no mistakes. Some of us have felt that way, haven't we? Probably even said that. And yet, as we look more deeply into God's ways with us and know God's principles, we see a wonderful logic in it all. You and I are called for something. I want you to listen to this very, very closely. You and I are called for something, laid hold of by God for something, put by God into something, and we feel God has made a mistake? No. We may say, I'm not the person for this. I ought never to have come into this. I have no qualifications for this. I am altogether the wrong peg here. And I'm sure those listening have felt that same way. We've felt that way. But see, God makes no mistakes. He has made us for a purpose, and He puts us in that purpose. And like I said, as long as we walk by His Spirit, we will fulfill that purpose. 
and we will walk in the works that he has prepared for us before the beginning of time. And yet, somehow or other, God does it. What does he do? He enables you. He carries you through. He accomplishes the work to your own surprise and wonder. By his grace, by his power, by his mercy. So many times, even we have said, Lord, I just don't feel like I can do this. I just don't feel like it's in me to do. I pull on your strength, Lord. I ask you for your strength, that you put your words in our mouths, Lord, and you bring us through. And he has over and over and over and over. That's the difference. We're not running on our own strength. We are being empowered by His strength. And there's a huge difference. A huge difference. As you lay hold of the Holy Spirit, it is done. That is, if you do not sink down into yourself and give up and draw out because of what you are. A lot of times we defeat ourselves by our own mouth, don't we? So negativism about everything it seems like at times. How in the world are we going to lay hold of the Holy Spirit and His strength and His power when these things keep being spewed out of our mouth like that? And we're giving them power because we keep saying them? Instead of quoting his word and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did that say through myself? No. Through Christ. Through Christ. Through Christ who strengthens me. You know, this is so important because it's not who we are or what we are. Or the fact that we may feel weak or strong or anything else. It's not because of us. And that's what causes the sinking down into ourself is when we start thinking it's something to do with us. And given that negative thing power by repeating it over and over and over. Letting it go out into the supernatural world and really giving the demons some ammunition against us because they can hear what we say it's real important to speak God's word and speak it in a way that you know it that you know it in your heart that to be true God will help me. He will bring me through this. He will enable me to do this. He will give me the strength to do this. And thank you, Lord, for giving me the strength to do this. Thank you for helping me, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving me a new outlook on this. Because he wants our dependence on him and him alone. He doesn't want us to be independent of him. He just does not want that. And he will allow the circumstances, sometimes even create the circumstances, where we will get out of independence, being dependent on us, into dependence on him. And him alone. But you lay hold of the Holy Spirit. Let me just read this other verse first. And you lay hold of the Holy Spirit. It is done. That is if you do not sink down into yourself. And give up. And draw out. Because of what you are. But you lay hold of the Holy Spirit. 
and you get through and marvel that you have got through, that the Lord has done this thing through you and through me. That's awesome, isn't it? He will give supernatural strength. He, he does it all the time. He does it to John and I all the time. When we are dependent on him and lay hold of him, his Holy Spirit, for the strength and not try to have the strength in ourselves because we know we don't. That is very consistent with God's principles. That is no contradiction. It is most consistent with the deepest principles of God. No flesh shall glory in his presence. No flesh. No flesh shall glory in his presence. And that goes back to what was said a minute ago about he wants us dependent on him. We may feel very weak or whatever in ourself. That's when we hang on to him, turn to him, cry out to him, and he gives supernatural strength. But the strength is coming from him. It's his strength. And he's the rock. He's not moved by all these outward things. He wasn't moved by it when he walked the earth. And that's the way he wants us to be, too. We can be strong in him. It's all coming back to him. God marked you elected. Mm -hmm. The foolish things of the world, the weak things, the things that are not. Let's look at that scripture. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 1 Corinthians one twenty eight, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Now, it doesn't say God's chosen the high and falutin and prideful and well-known in the earth and wealthy and all these other things, does he, that the world looks to in recognition. He doesn't say that in here, does he? No. He's chosen the things that the world thinks is foolish. That the world thinks looks foolish, lives foolish. Why does he do that? To confound the wise, the lifted up, the prideful. And he's chosen the weak things of the world, not the staunch, mighty things, the weak things. I just love this. And the base things. What's the base things? The low things of the world that the world thinks are low. Are lower than them. And the things which are despised. Which the world despises. Hath God chosen. And things which are not to bring to not things that are. He's kind of done a 180 there, hasn't he? It's definitely not the way the world thinks. And what the world holds in high esteem, that is not what God holds in high esteem at all. I want to look a little further into these verses, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28. But God hath chosen, or he has selected. Now, you just look at this. He has selected deliberately. In other words, when you choose something, you deliberately choose it. He hath chosen or selected the foolish 
and that word means the absurd, dull, or even stupid, the things the world thinks are stupid or absurd, those are the things the Lord has selected. Why? To confound or shame down or disgrace the wise, the lifted up, the prideful. And God hath chosen the weak, the feeble, without strength things of the world. Why? To confound the things which are mighty, that are powerful, strong, forcible. And also, most of all, to bring glory to his name. That's why. And he's chosen the base things, in verse 28, of humble origin or social status. Those things that are low in the eyes of the world. A low social status in the eyes of the world. Those are the things that he's chosen. And things which are despised, which are least esteemed. Not the things that are well known, recognized by the world, but the ones that are least esteemed in the eyes of the world. Hath God chosen? He has selected them. And things which are not, to bring to naught the, thing, the things that are. Isn't the Lord wise above all? Isn't he making a statement in these two scriptures right here? You know, it's the humble and the lowly. The contrite heart that God will turn his ear to. That he will turn his head to and notice. Just like the woman, the widow. He was sitting there watching the people in the temple give. But he noticed this widow. She was probably there with her children. And he watched her. And he knew her heart as well. And he saw that she gave all she had. All that she had. And Jesus noticed that. He noticed it so much, it's in the scriptures to this day. These are the things that the Lord pays attention to. He wants us to give all of our life, all that we have, should be for his glory. This is just an awesome thing. You know, even another example is that he chose Mary. A young, insignificant, humble girl in the eyes of the world to be the vessel to bring the Son of God into the world. They were looking for a flashy king, and he brought his son in right under their noses, and they didn't even see it nor recognize it. That's a statement, you guys. That's just a statement. And you know he's bringing his vessels in now, right under the noses of the pharisaical, prideful, lifted up people. And they don't recognize Jesus in those people. God has sent them to them. And they do the same exact thing they did to Jesus. They reject them. They want to cast them out to do away with them just like they did Jesus. Certainly God could not have sent his son in such a humble manner. It says basically he wasn't anything pretty to look at. You wouldn't be drawn to him. Same now. God has vessels now that don't look the prim and proper part. 
but they are the vessels of the Almighty God, and Jesus lives and reigns in them. They're being rejected now, just like Jesus was. Just like his word was rejected, his vessels of today's word is rejected and treated just like he was. You know, it's like you look at this and you just, you just have to say, what a wise God we have. How quickly he can show people their hearts what they're looking at, what they're really made of, what's really going on in their heart. It's like the Pharisees were sitting there saying all this stuff to him, this and that, you know, whatever, and he knew their heart. He said, yeah, you, you do the part, but you don't live the part. You might speak the part, but you don't live the part, he told him, basically. It's like he's saying, I can look into your heart, and there is nothing but dead men's bones there. There's no life there. I'm not there. It's all show. But what was he doing? He was still having mercy on them, showing them, speaking to them in hopes that they would turn and get the real thing. The real living relationship with the Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still doing that. He's still doing that today. It's all coming back to him. God mark you elected. The foolish things of the world, the weak things, the things that are not. It's the same word. He has elected. He has chosen. It is quite consistent. He still does it today, doesn't he? You look at those that he's chosen. Not anything in this world, but just simple people. Simple live, living. And just like days of old, the hypocritical mocker Pharisees do not recognize. But they themselves are lifting their own selves up in all their prim and proper and wealth and money and prestige and recognition and they're missing it. They're missing it today just like they missed it when he walked on the earth. They're missing him. They're missing his visitation because he's coming to them through this humble vessel that he sent. And he has many humble vessels. You know, this is such an important devotional today. Yes, his ways are past finding out. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. But he is consistent with his principles. A life in the Spirit is one succession of confirmations that God is working out a plan. In His Spirit, by His Spirit. As long as we walk in His Spirit. Now listen to this next part. Only rebellion stubbornness, self-assertiveness, and all forms of self-life will hinder or arrest. But a life in the Spirit will be a constant succession of proofs, of evidences that you were chosen for something. I want to go through these. Only rebellion, stubbornness, and self-assertiveness 
and all forms of self-life will hinder or arrest this. It will arrest this progression, okay, of God working out his plan in our life. These things will arrest that rebellion, stubbornness, and self-assertedness, any form of self-life. Now, when I was looking up these words, so interesting, the definition of rebellion. And I never saw this before, but when I looked at the word, I saw two words in rebellion. Rebel and lion. And I saw it as rebel lion. A lion is a very fierce animal, isn't it? Can be a very deadly animal, can't it? It rips and tears with its teeth, its prey, doesn't it? This is so, you know, I was just like, whoa, Lord, rebel, lion, rebellion. And the definition is the action or the process of resisting authority control, an act of violent or open resistance to an established government or ruler. Now, we're talking about God's authority here, y'all. That rebellion against him in any form, any self-life form, will hinder and arrest the progression of his work in us. Resisting his authority. Resisting his control over our life. Resisting his established government. His government. And resisting him as ruler of our life. The definition of stubbornness. Obstinate persistent in purpose or condition and resistant to change, unyielding, having or showing dog determination not to change, refusing to comply, agree, or give in, obstinate. Now we're talking in these terms, looking unto the Lord, what can cause and arresting of his work in us. Are we obstinate, persistent in our purpose or condition, resisting him, resisting to change when he says change? I want to bring this change in you to be unyielding to it, to be doggedly determined not to change to be refusing to comply to him to be refusing to agree with him to be obstinate against him this can cause an arresting of the progress of his work in us And the last one here is self-assertiveness, the act or an instance of putting forward one's own opinions, especially in an aggressive or conceited manner, our own opinions. This is not talking about speaking the word of God and speaking it boldly and with authority. This is talking about just asserting opinions over God's word and saying, well, this is probably what it means, this or that. This is my opinion. You hear that so much. Instead of people being sure, this is what God says. This is what it says, and this is what it means. No, okay, all the opinions come flowing through. No. No. It's an arresting of the work of God in the life. These three things. Stubbornness. 
self-assertiveness, rebellion. I'm going to read this part again. Only rebellion, stubbornness, self-assertiveness, and all forms of self-life will hinder or arrest. But a life in the Spirit will be a constant succession of proofs, of evidences that you were chosen for something. You notice when you walk by the Spirit, things flow, don't they? And God will give you a proof here, an evidence there. That you're going in the right way when you're walking by His Spirit. And you want to be led by His Spirit. And not your own Spirit or your own will. A life in the Spirit is one succession of confirmations that God is working out a plan. But these things, rebellion, stubbornness, and self-assertiveness, hinder and arrest that. God is not dealing with you just from hand to mouth, piecemeal. It is all worked out. You see that? It's already all worked out before the beginning of time. The works are all wrote out. And we are fitted individually for those works. God, good works, foreordained. A foreprepared that we should walk in them. Now, here's the key, you guys. If we walk in the Spirit, we walk in a four prepared works. Whether we see it or not, it is a fact. But it comes out wonderfully so, and we have to go down and say, here it is, y'all. Well, Lord, forgive us for arguing. Forgive us for discussing the matter. Forgive us for putting over our minds and what we think about it against you. You know, this little devotional, here it is, with all these things, it's going to end up in repentance with the true child of God. If any of these things are going on, rebellion, stubbornness, self-assertiveness, any of these things going on in the life of a true Christian, the end of that's they're going to be on their knees in repentance. And here it is, even in this little devotional. But it comes out. Wonderfully so. Repentance is a wonderful thing. It's a God-given thing. And we have to go down and say, Well, Lord, forgive us for arguing. Forgive us for discussing the matter when you've already settled the matter. Forgive us for putting over our minds and what we think and reason about it against you and what you've already said about it. You are wonderful, Lord, and we worship you. We worship you. We believe you. We trust you. And that is proof of election. And you do not want better proof than that. It's all inside of Christ. It's all by Jesus Christ. The work is done by Him. It's in Him and for Him. By His Holy Spirit. And as long as we walk by His Spirit, we are going to fulfill those works that He birthed us for. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this little devotional. I thank you so much for it, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will seal it to the hearts of the people listening. I pray that seed goes down deep and the roots are deep and the fruit goes up in a mighty fashion, Lord, and bears in a mighty fashion abundantly to your glory. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for the power of your word, the authority of your word, Lord. You have said it, and it is so, and it is done. 
Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen.